seeking knowledge or mahadirat. And the best thing a student can do is come to the come to the front and be close to the Shaykh as possible, inshallah. So if you guys can come forward for those that are listening, barakallahu feekum. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولقد خلقنا الإنسان ونعلم ما توسوس به نفسه ونحن أقرب إليه من حبل الوريد إذ يتلقى المتلقيان عن اليمين وعن الشمال قعيد ما يلفظ من قول إلا لديه رقيب عتيد وجاءت سكرة الموت بالحق ذلك ما كنت منه تحيد ونفخ في الصور ذلك يوم الوعيد وجاءت كل نفس معها سائق وشهيد لقد كنت في غفلة من هذا فكشفنا عنك غطاءك فبصرك اليوم حديد وقال قرينه هذا ما لدي عتيد ألقيا في جهنم كل كفار عنيد مناع للخير معتد مريب الذي جعل مع الله إلها آخر فألقياه في العذاب الشديد قال قرينه ربنا ما أطغيته ولكن كان في ضلال بعيد قال لا تختصموا لدي وقد قدمت إليكم بالوعيد ما يبدل القول لدي وما أنا بظلام للعبيد يوم نقول لجهنم هل امتلأت يوم نقول لجهنم هل امتلأت وتقول هل من مزيد وأزلفت الجنة للمتقين تقين غير بعيد هذا ما توعدون لكل أواب حفيظ من خشي الرحمن بالغيب وجاء بقلب ادخلوها بسلام ذلك يوم الخلود لهم ما يشاءون فيها ولدينا مزيد
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Again, it is a pleasure to be with you all today for the second day, for the second night. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the Imam of this masjid, Sheikh Ahmed Noor, to bless the second Imam of this masjid, Sheikh Abdullah Shire, and the rest of those who work in the administration of this masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and bless the rest of the community. I also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to greatly reward and to bless our dear brother Shaykh Al-Qari Al-Muqri Sadiq for that was a beautiful recitation. May Allah bless him and bless his students. We will repeat insha'Allah ta'ala a few points that we mentioned yesterday as a reminder to myself first and to you all. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَى تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And remind, for verily the reminder benefits the believers. The title of this lecture, as you all know, African scholars, their educational journeys unfolded. And we mentioned yesterday that the goal of this lecture is not to speak about specific individuals from the beginning of their lives to when they passed away. Rahmatullahi alayhim. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve and bless those who are still alive. Rather, we, we are trying to take pieces, snippets of their lives and see what we can benefit from it. What are the lessons that we can learn from it? And why this topic was chosen as we mentioned yesterday is because firstly, many people in the West, specifically the youth, do not really understand the fact that there are many scholars in the continent of Africa. And why did we even pick Africa and we did not pick Asia or no other part of the world? Firstly being that this masjid is mostly a predominant Somali masjid. Secondly being that I personally met a lot of African scholars more than any other continent. And thirdly, the lessons that I felt that I learned from these mashayikh are great lessons that I felt that would bless and not bless but those in this community would benefit from it. Firstly myself and the rest of those in this community and those who are listening live. Now, what made the scholars of Africa unknown? Why is it that majority of the people do not know the ulama of Africa? As we mentioned yesterday, one of the main reasons is their extreme poverty. And we even mentioned some stories regarding that. From those reasons is that they teach in their local language. So most of you all know that the ulama of Somalia, they don't teach in Arabic, they don't teach in English, they don't teach in Urdu, rather they teach in the Somali language. So who does that benefit? It benefits the Somali people wherever they are those who understand the language. But if someone does not understand the Somali language, then he will, not, he will never benefit from the scholars of Somalia. Just like the one who speaks Wolof, and he's from the country of Senegal, us sitting in, in this masjid, we don't understand Wolof. And so we cannot really benefit from their tapes, from their lectures. The time, the, 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 the moments or the times where we usually benefit from the ulama of other countries, either in Africa or out of Africa, when they're teaching their durus in the Arabic language or in English. We also mentioned that from the main reasons is that a lot of the scholars of Africa do not like to be known. They do not like to be known. Rather, I will share a story today of one scholar, insha'Allah ta'ala, that when I wanted to speak with him, I wanted to record our conversation. And one of his students told me that this shaykh he does not like to be recorded at all, no matter if it's video or audio. And yet, hundreds of thousands of students in his country have benefited greatly from him. 
and his knowledge has spread throughout the world. Also, we mentioned yesterday that the how a student from the West perceives knowledge to be and how it is sought is really not that correct. Most of them believe if you go to specific countries and you buy a plane ticket and you go there and you're with the other students that you will become a great scholar. And this is not the case as we explained yesterday. We also explained, and this is the last thing I'll mention from the points from yesterday, that the sciences of Al-Islam from this specific angle are divided into two. The signs which are the objectory sciences, the sciences that we hope to study day in and day out for the rest of our lives. Those sciences include al aqidah wa tawheed al-fiqh, al-hadith, al-tafsir, al-seerah, al-suluk wa tazkiyah Then we have the sciences that are the ulum al wasail the tools, the means, the sciences which are used to understand the sciences which are the ob objectory sciences that I mentioned earlier like Al-Nahw, Al-Sarf, Al-Balagha, Usul Al-Fiqh, Al-Qawaid al fiqhiya and the likes of them. The ulama of Al-Islam mentioned that the sciences of this deen can reach up to 60 different sciences if you were to branch out the sciences of Quran, the sciences of Al-Hadith, the sciences of Al-Fiqh, the sciences of the Arabic language, Al-Sira and the like it, can, it may reach up to 60 different sciences. From the stories I would like to share today that personally happened to me was with a sheikh when I was in Egypt. A sheikh that amongst Westerners is unknown. But he teaches in one of the main kulliyat of Al-Azhar and he's from the scholars of Al-Azhar. He teaches in the kulliyat known as Kulliyat al-Dirasat al-Islamiya wal arabiya and this shaykh is from the colleagues of a shaykh that is very known there, whose name is Muhammad Hassan Uthman. So this other shaykh, his name is a shaykh Nadi Hussein. The shaykh is a shaykh that I spent time with in Egypt. And subhanallah, from the things that I noticed from him was his extreme humbleness. And the reality is, that a lot of students, they find the opposite when they go to certain countries such as Egypt. You find that a number of people who teach in that country, you feel that there is a sense of ego. Not all of them, not the majority of them, but a good number of them. You feel like they know all that. You feel like they make you think that they're better than you or better than the rest of the people who teach that science. But this shaykh, wallahi, he never showed that. This shaykh was a shaykh that never took a single junay, which is the Egyptian pound, to teach what he was teaching. And it is very well known for anyone who goes to Egypt, how much you have to pay to study, to read Quran to a shaykh or to study these sciences. And so this shaykh sometimes will teach weekly to a group of students. He may teach daily if he knows a person personally. And so I sat with him a number of sittings. I would see, subhanAllah, even though the fact that this shaykh would not take a single junaid, an Egyptian pound, is like taking a penny. And, they, and, and, and learning in Egypt is now becoming costly. Is now becoming costly. Even though that was his situation, he would always give sadaqah to the poor students. I could not tell you how many times I would see an African student from Mali an African student from Senegal, an African student from Chad, an African student from any other country that would come to his masjid where I would be studying with him and the shaykh would take him to the side and give him money. And this taught me a few lessons. Number one, have qana'ah with what you have. Be content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. And don't be someone who's always trying to increase and increase and increase from the affairs of this dunya. As we all know, if you had two mountains of gold, you would want a third. If you had a, a, a job that makes you 100K, you, would want a, you, you, you wish you had another job that would make 100K. And so subhanAllah, this shaykh, even though there were multiple students studying with him, he never took from them a single junaid. 
I also learned from this that a person should hide his good deeds. We live in a time where every single person, every step he takes, he wants to show the world. Everything he does, from the person he meets, to the ijazah he takes, to the sitting he's sitting in, to the place he's going to, he wants to show everyone what he's doing. And what have you left for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And it's, it's very sad if someone says, I'm still mukhlis. Unless he has specific, specific shari reasons to do, uh, shari reasons for him doing what he is doing. But the reality, reality is today that many people, they spread the good deeds they're doing so that they become known. Also, what happened one day with this shaykh, an incident that I'll, I'll never forget, that really showed me the sincerity of the shaykh. And for those who have lived in Egypt will know what I'm talking about. One day I was in his masjid, and, he li- and he's in the Nasr city area. And my dars was between Maghrib and Isha. We were doing a tuhf al which is the sharh of al Rumiya. A book that many students start with when they're learning a Nahu Arabic grammar. And so this Shaykh, he would be the one who led the Salah in his masjid most of the time. And this Shaykh knows that he's over 65 years old. He's not someone who's young. He's over 65 years old. One day, I prayed Maghrib, the Shaykh was not there. Right after Salah, I lay on my phone and I see a call from the Shaykh. And so I answer the phone. I answered the call and the Shaykh said to me, where are you? I said to him, Shaykh, I'm in the masjid waiting for the dars. He said to me, I am coming from Ramses, which is an area known to those who've been in Egypt. From Nasr city, it is at least a 45 minute bus ride. By car now, it is at least 30 minutes, at least. Then he said to me, after the dars, I'm going back to an area near Ramses. So then I said to the Shaykh, Shaykh, are you coming all the way here for this dars? The Shaykh said to me, didn't I promise you that I'll give you a dars? I said, Subhanallah. Yani the Shaykh is coming 30 to 45 minutes at least just to give me a dars then to go back to the area he's coming from. Which shows me, Subhanallah, if a person a student, a teacher, a sheikh, a scholar is sincere in what he is doing, even if he is not gain, gain, gaining a financial gain, wallahi thumma wallah, those actions of humbleness, those actions of etiquette, those actions of mannerisms, those actions which affect the student are long lasting. And so we should try our best when we learn, when we study, then when we eventually hopefully teach, that we are as sincere as possible. We have ikhlas. That we try our best not to get a financial gain in what we are doing. Of course, we all have to live. Every human being has to live and has to make money somehow. That's not what we're talking about. But it has, it has become a point today that people are making money, trying to become rich through the way of ilm. And that is not the way of our prophets, nor it is the way of our scholars of the past and present. Another story I would like to share is with one of the great ulama of Mauritania. And there is no difference of opinion on this specific scholar, on his knowledge, on his humbleness, and the effect that he has done, and what he has done in teaching the people in Mauritania. Mauritania being a country in West Africa. This sheikh is over 90 years old has been teaching over 50 years. He came to Medina two years ago after the month of Ramadan. And I found out about his coming three days after the Shaykh was in Medina. And so I said to myself, this is a known Shaykh, a Shaykh who has a lot of students, a Shaykh who has done a lot for his country, a lot for the students in his country. And the Shaykh has Uh, generations, generations, about two or three now, generations of students have graduated in his hands. 
So I said to myself, if I go to the Shaykh, I definitely will benefit something. Even though the time he will be in Medina when I was there would be a few days. And Alhamdulillah, I ended up also seeing him in Mecca when he went to Mecca. And when I traveled to Mecca, I ended up also seeing him. And I saw the same things that I'm about to mention. Firstly, I saw the Shaykh would concentrate, would have khushu' what was apparent of course, in the salah, in the adhkar that he was doing. Also, there were times where he did not let the people talk to him and he was busy with what he is doing. And after that, the people would wait until he finished, for example, his adhkar or he would, or until he finished the recitation of the Quran he was reading. But the main thing that affected me a lot during my interaction with the Shaykh was one day after Salat al-Asr, I went early to the masjid to see and be with the Shaykh. And so after Salat al-Asr, it happened that there was no one with the Shaykh. And subhanAllah, every time before that, every time you would be with the Shaykh, there would be so many people around him because of him being known in his country. Him, again, as I said, being over 90 years old and teaching over 50 years. So I said to the Shaykh, I asked him a question. I said, Shaykh, أنا طويلب مبتدئ في طلب العلم. ماذا تنصحون? I'm a tiny, a small seeker of knowledge. Someone who's small, young, trying his best to tread this path of knowledge. What do you advise me? I knew the Shaykh would give me an advice because of his experience, because of his age, because of what he went through in his lifetime. And Alhamdulillah, that's what happened. The Shaykh said to me, Ansahuka bi ikhlas niya wa bi taqwa Allahi Azza wa Jal. I advise you with having sincerity and having taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa bi taqleel al durus wa bi kathrat al takra. And lessening the amount of lessons you take and in increasing the amount of times you repeat your lessons. And then the Shaykh said to me, and then I asked the Shaykh, then I asked the Shaykh, because of what he said now, كم كنت تحفظ يوميا حينما كنت طالبا? How much did you used to memorize when you used to be a student? Then the Shaykh said to me, ما كنت مجتهدا في طلب العلم لذلك تراني في هذا الحال أنا فيه. I was not a good student of knowledge. I was not someone who strived in the seeking of knowledge and that's why you see me in the state I am in. I said to myself, Subhanallah, for a person who's been teaching over 50 years, for someone who has had over two, generation, two generations of students who have graduated in his hands, he still is, trying, is saying basically I've done nothing. And that showed me and taught me a number of lessons. The main one being that, my dear brothers and sisters, we have to be, have to be as humble as possible. And we all know that the one who is humble and puts himself down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise that person up. Also going back to his nasa'ih, his advices, when the shaykh said, Ansahuka. بتقليل الدروس وبكثرة التكرار when he said I advise you with lessening the amount of lessons you take and increasing the amount of times you repeat your lessons why did he give me this advice? the main reason being that the Mauritanians are known for not studying many different sciences they are known for not taking too many durus, too many lessons one time. Why is that? The reason being is that if you take too many lessons, then how are you going to truly review everything that you have taken from your shaykh? Yani you could take a lesson today, you could, lesson, you could take a lesson tomorrow. I come back and I ask you about the lesson, those two lessons, two weeks later, three weeks later. If you have no idea what you took two or three weeks prior, 
then in all honesty, you are not really benefiting from your seeking of knowledge. It's just a circle that you are, you are in. Studying, learning, forgetting. Studying, learning, forgetting. Studying, learning, forgetting. How do we not be in the circle, the cycle of studying, learning, forgetting? I found that being with the Sheikh and being with other scholars of Africa, I noticed that they have a specific methodology that I advise myself and with you with. Firstly, when you take a lesson from a Sheikh, firstly, your lesson shouldn't be too many. It should be something that you can handle, which was the advice of the Sheikh. When you take a lesson, you must review the lesson right after the dubs, right after the lesson. It is not something that if you take the lesson, for example, tonight, let's say we have a lesson all together and we're studying with our Sheikh, the Imam of this Masjid, Abdullah Shira Fiqh Shafi'i. We have a lesson with him. And then we go home, we eat food, we enjoy ourselves. Tomorrow we go to university and then at night we're with our family. So I look at, then I look at the lesson two days from now. If you are a person who is doing that, then you are definitely making a huge mistake in the way you are reviewing your lessons. Rather, a lesson should be reviewed right after, as soon as possible. Why? Because that information is still fresh in your mind. If you're also able to review those lessons with your colleagues, with your classmates, with the other students, that is even better. Because that's what I found the Mashaykh of Africa doing greatly. They would always take a lesson with the Shaykh right after that. And this was a known methodology in Somalia, a known methodology in Mauritania, a known methodology in Senegal and, and, and other countries as well. Right after the Shaykh gets up and leaves, the students would come together. They would review the lesson together in the place they took the lesson, if that was something possible. And then every student would literally repeat the lesson from beginning to end what he heard from the Shaykh. If that student made a mistake, there would be obviously other students present that would correct that student. No, the Shaykh did not say that. You forgot that. You are mistaken by what you understood. That's what comes with uh, reviewing with other students. After that, the students would disperse or go on about their days, uh, about their day, and would review the lesson. The next day, they would do the same thing with the Sheikh or the next class, whenever it is. At the end of the week, the students used to review the lessons from beginning to end. So it is a cycle of learning, reviewing, learning, reviewing. But it does not stop there. Rather, when the student finishes the kitab, the book that he studied with his sheikh, the teacher would make that student, especially if he sees that he understood the book correctly, to teach the next batch of students. So now what happened? He's a student, he is reviewing with his peers, and he is now a teacher. With this cycle of studying, reviewing, teaching, that information is not forgotten. And so that is what I found with this Shaykh and with the other Mashaykh that I mentioned yesterday. My brothers and sisters, I noticed from the meetings that I had with these Mashaykh and with the biographies that I read from the ulama of Africa, their extreme, their extreme conserving of time, how they looked at time how they used to safeguard their time. The great poet said, or before that, also the ulama of Africa, while they used to safeguard their time, they used to have high, high aspiration. And these are two things that sadly, we as young brothers and sisters in the West do not have. We love to waste our time, or we don't really care if we waste our time, nor do we have high aspirations. When you say to someone, why did you go to a dars? He'll say, because I see everyone else going to it, so I just, you know, I'm going to it as well. Why are you going overseas? He may say to you, I see subhanAllah such and such person having a platform, and so I would also like to have a platform. 
such a low goal, a low aspiration one has. The great poet, he said, وَمَنْ تَكُنِ الْعَلْيَاءُ هِمَّةُ نَفْسِهِ فَكُلُّ الَّذِي يَلْقَاهُ فِيهَا مُحَبَّبُ وَمَنْ تَكُنِ الْعَلْيَاءُ هِمَّةَ نَفْسِهِ فَكُلُّ الَّذِي يَلْقَاهُ فِيهَا مُحَبَّبُ This line of poetry means that in your journey of attaining that high goal, any obstacle that comes in your way, it doesn't bother you. Rather, you love it. We all know those goals we put for ourselves. And maybe attaining that bachelor's degree, that master's degree, that PhD, a lofty goal, or maybe trying to complete a specific book, whatever the case may be. It is something in life, I guarantee that you will face obstacles. And so what happens to most people, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from it, whatever obstacles come, they quit, they stop, they end the journey. Rather, a person should say to himself, there is no way for me to achieve that goal without me going through these obstacles. And that's what I noticed from the ulama of Africa. That the obstacles they faced in their journey of knowledge were num numerous. From the main ones, as we mentioned yesterday, was extreme poverty. I have not come across one single sheikh. I'm not saying it does not exist. But I personally have not come across a sheikh that I personally met or read their biography that grew up rich or grew up having money. All of them, without any exceptions, were poor. And I mentioned to you all the story yesterday and I'll repeat it again for those who were not here. One of the scholars of Somalia mentioned to me that we used to be extremely hungry in our seeking of knowledge. We used to sometimes go days we're not talking about hours or minutes, which is our case today. You barely find someone, you know, from a Muslim family who goes days without food, especially in the West. But subhanAllah, that is something normal overseas for those of you who lived overseas and came from your respective countries. Know that poverty is something prevalent. So he told me that there, were, there was a specific student that did not eat for four to five days. Maybe more than that. He was at a point where he would literally just sit in the masjid. He could not do anything. He could not hold a book. He cannot read. He cannot memorize. He cannot. Rather, he couldn't. He couldn't even walk because of how hungry he was. This sheikh said to me that one day when we were in the masjid, a person that nobody knew, no one in the masjid knew this person, walked in went straight to the student, gave him food, and walked out. And everyone just looked at each other. They said to themselves, who is this person? Nobody in that area knew that person. And that student himself also did not know this person. This sheikh said to me, I have no other explanation for this, except that this person was a malik from the malaika, was an angel from the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw the sincerity of this individual. How sincere he was in his path of knowledge. How much he was struggling. How much he was striving to the point where it is possible. It is possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can send an angel from his angels to be in the shape, a form of a human being and he gives him food. Which shows us and gives us a few, a few lessons. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala kulli shay'in qadir. How many times did he say in the Quran, Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Wallahu ala kulli shay'in qadir. Too many times. Can't count it. But do we really believe it? Do we really ponder over it? How do we feel when we're facing those difficult times? And we feel like there's no, no way out. Do we doubt? Do we have even an Adam's weight of doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take us, of that, take us out of that situation? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees from students of knowledge in Africa and in other than Africa, 
their sincerity, their striving, in their quest for knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ease for them every affair. Rather, He may subhanahu wa ta'ala bring for them a miracle, something that no one has ever seen. Wallahu ala kulli shayin qadir. From the scholars that I met but I didn't really interact with, I only gave him salam and I wasn't able to do more than that. And he passed away rahmatullahi alayhi during COVID. The great scholar of Mecca, the great Ethiopian scholar, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Adam Al-Ethiopi, and sometimes pronounced as Al-Ethiopi. This great Ethiopian scholar was the most known African scholar in Mecca. He rahmatullahi alayhi studied with his father who was a great, great scholar. And subhanallah, how many people know his father, Ali Adam al-Ethiopi? Who knows about him? Who knows his biography? Who knows when he started seeking knowledge? Who knows when he even passed away? But subhanallah, it seems, wallahu ta'ala a'lam, that Sheikh Muhammad Ali Adam's father was someone who was very sincere. Because subhanallah, the type of individual, individual that Sheikh Muhammad ended up becoming, and the scholar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him to be, and the benefits, and the service he did for Islam is something great. That of course goes on the scale of his father. He rahmatullahi alayhi wrote many, many books. Something that in a human being who knows these books, if he ponders over it, he'll say to himself, how did he even write these books? When did he have the time to write these books? Especially knowing that the Shaykh Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he used to teach in the known institution in Mecca called Darul Hadith Al Khayriya in the morning. And then he also used to teach in the, in, in the Masajid in Mecca. And then in the, end of, in, in, in the end of his life, he was given permission to teach in the Haram in Mecca. He used to teach in the Masajid of Mecca after Salat Al Isha. Then when did he have time to write all of these books? His explanation of Sahih Muslim comes in 44 volumes. His explanation of Sunan and Nasa'i comes in 40 volumes. And he also wrote many other books that reach about 60 books. This Shaykh was known to be someone who safeguarded his time. To the point that one of the Somali Mashaykh one time went to him and he said to him, Ya Shaykh, I have a question, I have two questions. The Shaykh said to him, I only give you permission to ask one. So he asked this question, it was a question in the sciences of a hadith. And then the Shaykh said to him, after he answered this question, that many of the scholars of, Is of Al Islam during their lifetime they were writing books. And while they were writing these books, they passed away and they never completed the writing, the explanation of their books. And so please, I do not want to be from those people, so please leave me alone. Yani this Shaykh, he was known to be someone who never wasted his time. Anytime he was asked to come to a gathering after his dars, after Salat al-Isha, he said upon one condition that I will stay for a very, very short period of time and then I will leave. Unless, of course, if it was something extremely beneficial, maybe there are exceptions. Every time the Shaykh would go to a gathering and then it would happen where he could not leave and, he, and his stay would be prolonged and the benefit was not too much, of course it's still an ilmi environment, it's still a, an environment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being mentioned and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is being mentioned and, and maybe even fawaid are being mentioned. But the Shaykh would say, subhanallah, I wish I was in my house so I can, so I would have written some pages, some more pages of my books. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that the Shaykh would not complete the Sharh of At-Tirmidhi. He only wrote only, imagine only, 
wrote 21 volumes and he did not complete it because of him passing away. He also wrote four volumes of the Sharh of Sunan Ibn Majah. But because of his death during COVID, he did not pass away. Now, I'm, I don't think he passed away because of COVID. During the last few years of his life, he was very sick. And so, the last, I believe, three to five years, if I'm not mistaken, he did not write that much. The Shaykh was also known to be someone who had strong memory. He was someone that memorized a lot. And this is something, my dear brothers and sisters, that many Western students of knowledge do not understand its importance, especially when it comes to studying Al-Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ But this Qur'an, its ayat are preserved in the hearts of those who have been, be, in the hearts of those who have been given knowledge. My brothers and sisters, if you want to be a, a person of ilm, someone who actually studies the way knowledge has been sought from the time of the Prophet wasallam, you have to be a person who memorizes Quran, memorizes a hadith, memorizes the texts of the scholars of the past and present. One of the poets, he said, لَيْسَ بِعِلْمٍ مَا حَوَلْ قِمَطْرُ مَا الْعِلْمُ إِلَّا مَا حَوَاهُ الصَّدْرُ Knowledge is not what is in Al-Qimatru. Al-Qimatru is Wi'a Al-Kutub. It is what the books, what contains and holds books. Knowledge is not merely in books. Rather, مَا الْعِلْمُ إِلَّا مَا حَوَاهُ الصَّدْرُ the reality of ilm, the reality of this Islam is what is preserved and held in the hearts of mankind. The Imam al Shafi'i, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, what did he say? A famous line of poetry that many of us have heard. Ilmi ma'i haythu ma yammamtu yatba'uni. صدري وعاء لا جو صدري وعاء له لا جوف صندوقي إن كنت في البيت كان العلم فيه معي إن كنت أو كنت في السوق كان العلم في السوق إن كنت في البيت كان العلم فيه معي my knowledge is with me everywhere I go my knowledge is with me in my house إن كنت في البيت علمي معي عفوا علمي معي حيث علمي معي حيث ما يممت يتبعني my knowledge is with me everywhere I go صدري وعاء له لا جوف صندوقي my chest is what holds the knowledge it is not merely in the books إن كنت في البيت كان العلم فيه معي if I'm in the house my knowledge is with me أو كنت في السوق كان العلم في السوق and if I was in the سوق in the marketplace then the knowledge is in the سوق the true scholars of Al Islam my dear brothers and sisters realized that علم has to be memorized and so this Sheikh Sheikh Muhammad Ali Adam Al Ethiopi was someone who realized this someone who put great importance in memorization to the point where he memorized Al-Bukhari. Where even the students in Dar al-Hadith al-Khayriya, and we're talking about, we're not talking about Al-Matn faqat, bal Al-Sanadu wal-Matn. The text of the Hadith with the chain of narration. To the point that sometimes students, when they would be reading these Ahadith in the classroom, the Shaykh would correct them from his memory because of how much time he put in memorization and in knowledge. And there was a story mentioned concerning the Shaykh and memorization that one day after Hajj, the students came back to class because during Hajj, there is a break in Saudi Arabia. If, of course, if Hajj is during the school year. And so when the, the Shaykh asked them, what did you guys benefit from this ijaz, from this break? So the students, they put their heads down, realizing that they wasted their time. 
which is sadly the case for most students. They feel like the weekend or maybe the days they don't have class is a time of relaxation, a time of not doing anything, a time of not reading, a time of not reviewing, a time of not memorizing. But the true scholar, the true student of knowledge knows his break is in Al-Jannah. Of course, you have you know, times where you relax and you sleep and you take a nap. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the books is on one side of the room and you're on the other side. Or you took a whole trip and there's not a single book with you because you just want to leave it for the next week. The scholars don't do that. True students of knowledge don't do that. And you will see from this story the connection, the relationship that Sheikh Muhammad Ali Adam Ethiopi Rahmatullahi Alayhi had with knowledge. And so when the Sheikh saw their reaction that they wasted their time, he asked one specific student whose name is Abdullah. He said to him, what did you do during the break? He said to him, I read a small book about the mannerisms you should have in the, dif in the differing, the differences of opinion. Adab al-Khilaf, a small book. So when he mentioned that, the Sheikh subhanAllah realized that the students' himma, their aspiration, their drive, their goals is very low. They're just wasting their time. Look at what this sheikh said. He said, as for me, as for myself, and imagine when he's saying this, he's over 60 years old. He's over 60 years old when he's saying this. Or at least 50, if I'm mistaken, at least 50 years old. He's saying, as for myself, during this break, I memorized Al-Fiyatu Al-Iraqi fi Sira. Al-Iraqi Rahmatullahi Alayhi He wrote a 1,000 line poem in the Sira of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said to them, during my break, I memorized this whole poem. The students were shocked. So one student said to him, Kam baytan tahfadhu fil yawm? And how much were you memorizing every single day? So the Shaykh said, أَحْفَظُوا سِتِّينَ أَوْ سَبْعِينَ بَيْتًا أَثْنَاءَ تَنَاوُلِ كَأْسًا مِنَ الشَّاعِ Look at that. The Shaykh said, I used to memorize 60 to 70 lines a day while I was drinking tea. And now some of us are going, are going to say, how is that even humanly possible? For someone to memorize 60 to 70 lines a day. Let me give you a side example that will, allow, that will help understanding this point. When a person becomes a Muslim, a non-Muslim, he accepts Islam. Doesn't he find it extremely difficult to memorize Surah Al-Fatiha, let alone a whole juz? That's for him something like 20 pages? How am I going to memorize a whole juz? I can't even do Al-Fatiha, seven ayat. And then for us sitting here, any juz, that's nothing. For the Shaykh, 60 to 70 lines was nothing. Rather, he even said, one time I can memorize 100 lines a day if I wanted to. How is that even possible? The reason because of his connection to knowledge. How much he sacrificed for the sake of knowledge. There probably, probably wasn't a single hair on his body except that it was towards knowledge, towards teaching it, towards applying it, towards spreading it. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees a person's dedication towards something of khair, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will aid him in it. And so I conclude with that story. I hope that one day inshaAllah ta'ala I come back to this masjid and I share the life story of one great Imam that has not been shared yet online in Arabic nor in English and that is the great Shaykh Al-Allama Muhammad Al-Amin Al-Harari who is the great Ethiopian scholar which his life story is something amazing but because of time we hope that one day inshaAllah Allah allows us to come back to share his and this Shaykh, he passed away, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, and I did mention him yesterday for those who were here. He passed away in 2019, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. And he is someone that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave him this karama, this gift, that there was not a single book he started writing except he finished it. And his mu'allafat, his 
the books that he authored are too many to count. Just like a Sheikh Muhammad Ali Adam in Ethiopia. Also the Sheikh, when I met him, he was 87 years old. And when I walked in, so I said to a friend of mine who was studying Dar al-Hadith al-Khayri, he used to teach alongside with a Sheikh Muhammad Ali Adam al Ethiopia, both of them being from Ethiopia. I asked a friend of mine who is from Algeria, I said to him back in 2017, end of 2017, I said to him, I want to visit the Sheikh. Where can I find him? Where can I meet him? He said, pray Salatul Fajr in the Haram in Mecca, then go straight to Dar al-Hadith al-Khayriya. That's exactly what I did. When I walked in, I saw that the entrance room, the hall, the lights were on, everywhere else it was off, showing that the Sheikh was the first one there with his student. When we walked in, I knew how the Sheikh looked like because there was only one video. There were no pictures like there is now, but at that time there was only one video that was very blurry online. So I had an idea how the Sheikh looked like. I went up to the Sheikh, I gave him salam. Wallahi, the way he gave myself and two other brothers who were with me salam was something amazing. He was so happy to see us. And he started talking to us. And then everyone who came in, he would say, Sallim, Sallim alayhim, ha'ulai duyufi. Ha'ulai duyufi. He said, give salam to them. They are my guests, they are my guests. Look at this humbleness. Look at this humbleness of the Shaykh. Then we went with the Shaykh downstairs. He used to teach at the basement of Dar al Hadith al Khayriya. Sharh Lamiyat al Af'al. Lamiyat al Af'al, for those who do not know, is a known kitab, a known metan, classical text by Al Allama, Al Imam, Al Nahwi, Al Lughawi, Ibn Malikin. Not Al Imam Malik in Al Fiqh, but Ibn Malik, who is the one who wrote al fiyat ibn Malik, the famous text in al nahw al -Sarf. And which this text, Lamiyat al-Af'al, is known to be taught greatly in Somalia. So if you talk to any Somali sheikh, they know this text very well. That they either heard of it, or maybe studied it, or maybe even teach it. And so, he was teaching this kitab. We were sitting there. I didn't know Arabic at the time. Arabic was very weak, but I was just so happy to see, to see the sheikh. And, though, and then after his dars, we said to the Shaykh, because the actual uh, class was starting in Dar al-Hadith al-Khayriya, so we said to the Shaykh, can we come with you to the classroom? Can we come with you to the classroom? So the Shaykh said to us, no problem. We were three people, we went with the Shaykh. And so right before class started, he prayed four raka'at of Salatul Duha, which is a Salah prayed 15 to 20 minutes after sunrise, and up to just before Dhuhr. You pray two, four, six, eight, ila akhiri. The pray, the Shaykh prayed four raka'at. Imagine, he's 87 years old. He prayed four raka'at without a chair and without a walking stick. He, he stood normally. He made ruku'ah normally. He made sujood normally. I was amazed. And all I can remember was the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ihfadillah yahfad. The famous hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ advised the Sahabi to safeguard the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you do that, يَحْفَظْكَ اِحْفَظِ اللَّهَ مَا جَوَابُ الْأَمْرُ اِحْفَظِ اللَّهَ هَذَا هُوَ الْأَمْرُ مَا جَوَابُ يَحْفَظْكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will safeguard you. Because of you, safeguarding the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After that, the Shaykh he had a class in the tafsir of Al-Imam Al-Shawkani. Again, was just happy to sit there, did not understand anything the Shaykh was saying, but SubhanAllah, was happy to see the Shaykh. Then something amazing happened. The Shaykh, and this was the norm of the Somali Mashaykh and the Mashaykh of East Africa, especially at that time, the old school Mashaykh as we would say. When they're teaching, they're not really engaged with the students too much. They're just talking and looking at the book, you know? And that's what the Shaykh was doing. So after that, it was question and answer time. So one student on my right side, because I was in the front, raised his hand, and he asked the Shaykh a question. The Shaykh looked at him and said, Do I know you? The student says, Ya Shaykh, I've been studying with you for the last four years. 
we all started laughing because it was such a funny moment. But I started to think. And I spoke to the Sheikh's son, Ridwan, his oldest son. And I said to him, I, I, I told him about this incident. I said, Sheikh, it's either one of two situations that happen. One of two scenarios. Either, either the Sheikh forgot because of his old age, or the Sheikh was such in a zone with his teaching, with the book that he was with, he forgot what was around him. And I believe it was the second one. Even his son said, me knowing my father, it was the second. The Sheikh forgot who that student was because of how engrossed he was with the ilm. And there is a video towards the end of his life that when the Sheikh was in a state of ghaybubah, he has no idea what's going on. His, he was very sick. He was basically out. But he was still, he was not in a coma. But he did not know what was going around. There's a video of him in the hospital bed. In that state, making wudu in the air. As if he's taking water, making wudu, and about to pray. And he's not mentally there. Which showed the Shaykh's connection with salah. How much he used to pray day in and day out. And that's what we mentioned yesterday, my dear brothers and sisters. It's not mere reading books and sitting and staying up all night and memorizing all these alfiyat, all of these uh, texts. Rather, the first thing we should focus on is what is our relationship and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is the status of our hearts? That's what I will conclude with insha'Allah ta'ala. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me for any mistakes that I have made and to bless you all. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be of those who benefit from what was mentioned. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakum khayran. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. We would like to shaykh our shaykh, I thank our shaykh, Abdullah Sharif, our brother that came to visit us from uh, Virginia in Pennsylvania, alhamdulillah. He called me during Ramadan. Uh, saying he was two hours away from Seattle and I told him it was La Buddha yani he had to come to Seattle and come visit the community and give a two-day muhadira and our friendship counted on it yani he had to come and alhamdulillah you see the sheikh he came may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and we hope that that he comes yani, uh, more times and we, we would like to thank him for these two-day lecture that he gave us these beautiful insights um, the, yani the advice is And Wallahi the brother MashaAllah yani He has many stories I was just sitting there And thinking to myself he's, he's holding back Maybe we should have made it A three day or four day lecture Or like in Lil Asif al-Shadid We only have two days But next time inshallah We'll make it five days Inshallah um, Please make dua for the brother We only have a few more minutes to Isha Tomorrow there is a private sitting With the Sheikh on how to how to seek knowledge we want this private sitting it's not going to be a lecture it will only be question and answers inshallah where the student or the person that's interested in seeking knowledge asks questions inshallah and then that's where you can get the real advices how to go about it what books you should start where you should start how to find a teacher where you should find your teacher if you guys can benefit please there is a link online you can sign up inshallah and if you if you want the link afterwards you can ask us or you can ask any of the mashaykh that are here may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you guys make dua for the shaykh barakallahu feekum ahsanallahu ilaykum hadha billahi tawfiq wa sallallahu ala nabina muhammad wa ala lusa bajma'in assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar 
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة Yeah. 